innovation is a word that's banded around a lot uh, that we see now. Even the government, you know, has got an innovation policy. You know, companies are saying they're innovative. Are we innovative? Elle, do you think we're innovative? Well, I wouldn't say the word innovation now. I, I thought I was an innovative person. However, over the past two years, I've come to realise that, I, in actual fact, I was just very good at quality improvement. Um, however, the skills that I have learnt over the past two years and further developed is that innovation isn't imitating what's out there already. It's actually having that confidence to truly think about problem solving in a totally different way. I agree. David, do you think yeah. we're innovative? Um, I think in some aspects, definitely. Um, and that is that we've taken an approach of something's uh, not working and we've then gone and said, okay, if we didn't have these boundaries, constraints, if we didn't have these rules, how would how would it look? How would we how would we structure it? How would we do it? And I think from that point of view, the fact that we weren't confined to any rules, regulations, that type of stuff, when we're going through the thought process, I think that that's the innovative part. Whether the solution becomes innovative or not, I think it's the way that it's been looked at that's probably the innovative part. Yeah, look, I agree. I think the word innovation. Is a poor word. We've actually we've actually taken on a new word in the sense that we say we're neoteric, which actually truly describes what we do. Because innovation, pretty much these days, is about improving something you've already got in existence. But in, in actual fact, we have to still do that in some ways. So in some ways, we've got things that we do have to improve. We've got boundaries. We've got you know compliance requirements. We've got you know rules and regulations. So if you look at the fact that. Uh, we became a registered training organisation, or an RTO, at a time when people said that was unable to be done. We looked at a framework, we said, we've got to use a framework that exists, but what can we do that's different? It was an innovative approach to it, it's a thought process that we've used. What we've created from that is a game-changing or a game-creating um, methodology to deliver to industry, because we recognised what wasn't there, uh, you know, what was there wasn't working. Um, in terms of that, our experience has been, let's just go to the RTO world. People have said to us, why have you become a registered tra a training organisation? Why do you not want to be known as one? Why, why is that the case? Why is that innovative in itself? I think the thing is, so many people set up an RTO just to think about training, not actually thinking about a whole workforce, a whole industry. And I think whilst we use using and are a registered training organisation, it is actually only a tool that we're using to deliver those quality outcomes for industry, for organisations. I agree. David? It's one, it's one of the boundaries that you have to unfortunately comply with because there's nothing else out there at the moment. Yeah. So if you want to be in that space and you want to make the changes, that's one of the rules that you need to follow. So I think it's more it was we had to do it to comply, to be able to get then into doing the innovative side of it and approaching things very differently. Uh, what I find, or what I bring to the, the, um, our people is very different to Alan and Lisa. Um, the reason for that is I'm actually not from an RTA, not from a training background, but I have, in my various roles, had to set up and organise training for the people that work for me. And that in itself, um, where every time I've gone to do that, because I'm very customer focused and very um, uh, user friendly from that perspective that I want to see a result and the result needs to be not a result on a piece of paper and a certificate sitting on the wall, I want to see a result that makes a difference in the workplace that I'm working at. So if I train people or I want people trained, then I want this result and the result has to be something that is tangible in the business that I work for. So not coming from an RTO or from a training background. Um, the conversations I've had over the years has been very, very, very difficult to get a lot of training organisations to actually comply with that. And I didn't think it was anything difficult. Um, and it obviously is very difficult um, to get because none of them, are, or a lot of them aren't set up for that. They're all set up for, here's a piece of paper and here's a certificate on the wall, therefore you can do it. Um, whereas what I've found is you might have the theory behind it, but you actually can't implement it. I think one of the one of the strongest things that David brought to our business in the very first instance though was whilst we are we, we have as a component we use as a tool being a registered training organisation and, and to a degree it was one of the the biggest tools that we're using because we're actually using people and capability to drive outcomes for a business. 
was the fact that we did have to become a registered training organisation within a framework of Australia, which is the Australian Skills Qualification Authority. What the value was that David brought to us is that Elle and I have worked for you know, 20, 30 years in a world that was so traditional that we had ourselves had become fairly um, indoctrinated. This is the way it's done and you can't challenge it. What David's given to us is an ability to go, actually, you can challenge it, you can do it, you can do it in a different way. So the amazing thing about setting up our people and is, is the most empowered thing that we've got to deliver to people is when they say to us, um, you can't do it, we can say, well, actually, yes, you can. So to go to an audit to become a registered training organisation that normally takes you know, a 12-month process and quite complex, we cut away all the white noise, all the peripheral um, materials that are around and said, what is it we're trying to achieve for the customer, not for the Australian Skills Qualification Authority? That should be a given. It's, it's always got to be a customer focus. So we were able to take away all that noise, make it simple, challenge everything that we knew as traditional and come back to absolute bare basic simplicity to the point where procedures that we had that were you know, 20, 30 pages are now one page long and in a diagrammatic format, which means we can give it to somebody and they can understand what we're doing. Has it been a challenge? Yes, it definitely has from our perspective. But what it has is it's shifted us to truly understand that innovation and creativity is completely new and doing something completely different. I mean, from Elle's perspective, Elle came from a community services and a disability background and a people background. And again, it was a very traditional government background. How's that challenged what you've known as normal? I think what I've always wanted and ensured that I've delivered a quality service no matter where I'm doing and to have an, em an empowering approach for people. And I think what we've been able to do here is actually be able to get an outcome, a quality outcome, and actually challenge that hierarchical or bureaucratic approach and simplify getting the quality outcomes that we need and what industry is wanting, but in a way that makes them think as well too. And it's that true empowerment through knowledge that um, I've learnt more so over the last two years than just focusing on, well, this is the only way. There are so many other ways to get to that quality mm -hmm. outcome. I think in terms of, from my perspective as a CEO, I have a team of people around me that David, without a doubt, would have to be the most innately experienced person that I've ever come across in terms of business improvement and process improvement. He will challenge even the most minor um, process to ensure that it's simple from a customer's perspective, asks questions that challenge us on a daily basis, certainly challenge me on a daily basis, but I think that's, that's a huge quality to have because the customer expects that. But I think it also drives our business to be improved. It means if we can have greater efficiencies, we've got an ability to deliver that to the customer. From Elle's perspective as a CEO, I have somebody who is very much people focused, very grounded, sees it from an empathetic and a passionate point of view. So we never lose that uh, in the processes that we drive. But I think ultimately the three of us together have a great combination to drive, you know, terrific outcomes um, for our customer. And I mean, we're quite often, you know, posed with um, questions such as, you know, what are the values of a business, you know, go to market, what's your brand, all of that sort of stuff. What's missing in that, David? What's Us. missing in that conversation? In most of those conversations, the customer. Yeah. It's who's it being delivered to, why is it being delivered, and what does that customer want to get out of it? So what's in it for them? If there's nothing in it for them, forget it. It's not going to work. Mm. Correct. Yeah. They've got to feel valued in it. They've got to actually get something tangible out of it. And at the end of the day, they need to be able to use that. And it's not just use it in that organisation. It's a life skill. They need to be able to use it everywhere they go. Do you think, all that businesses, and, and ex from our experience in business, that businesses understand who their customer is? Absolutely not. I, I think they've forgotten entirely on who their customer is and what it is that they are really wanting. It's a great example where you can ask somebody, 
to build you something and they will get there and build a fantastic house or deliver a wonderful product. But having forgotten to ask me, what is it that I want? And I think that's where people really need to get back to who is their customer and why. I think, I think customers are understood from a, they pay our bills. Mm. Um, but I think that's nearly as far as it goes. Um, whereas I think it's a lot more than who's paying our bills, it's who's paying our bills to keep us afloat today, but it's the customer internal and external that's going to drive and grow a business to be there in the long term. So I think that side of it's probably what's missing. Most people understand the customer is someone that pays, um, but there's a service that should go along with that and there's an expectation that that customer has. Mm. And I think that it's the expectations that just aren't discussed often enough to enable people to really truly value a customer and then set their business up to assist with the customer. Mm. I agree. I think our business plan when we first started the business, uh, we've, and we've stuck to that, I think one of the things that is, is our absolute strength is we actually were able to sit down in a room and whiteboard out what our future for the next 5, 10, 15 years was as far as what we were trying to achieve. Um, in that, in that, in those goals, um, as our people, but I think ultimately, why has our focus in some ways had to change on what we were going to start with first? So we thought we'd, we'd start with a customer. You know, we'd go out and get a, a client of you know 100 people, or we do we do a contract, and we sort of start small. Why have we actually had to refocus what we're doing and start at industry wide change? What what's what's been the reason we've had to do that and turn our customer focus to being a whole industry customer? Why is that? I think it was just the frustration of why do we need to just look at one small area? We've got to look at systemic change and I think that's when you start looking at a whole industry. And in actual fact, while our focus has uh, changed slightly, it's still exactly the same as what we've been delivering with one-on-one -on -one service. But that frustration of trying to change one, then two, looking at that bigger picture and moving forward. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing too is as an industry, if, if you've got boundaries on that, to change one or two, you're just still moving them within those boundaries. Whereas if you can take the industry and move those boundaries to something that's more feasible, then everybody within that has a lot more um, capability and freedom to move within those newer boundaries, wider boundaries that aren't quite as, as narrow. Mm, I agree.